Hello everybody, welcome to this Sunday morning service. Um, this is a service that I took at Long Home a couple of weeks ago. If you were at that service, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it's the same one again. David asked me to put it online because he's away this week. We begin with a hymn of praise and thanksgiving to God. Hymn number 307. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. We're going to join together in prayer in a moment. But before we do, let's take a time to just prepare ourselves to enter into God's presence. Just as on a Sunday morning we might get all dressed up in our best to go to worship at church, let us just suspend for a moment the cares of the day. Forget what we're cooking for Sunday lunch or if the dog's been ill while we've been out. Let's focus on the Almighty God the God we are speaking to. We can come in love and reverence and awe, come as if coming to a father, but come also remembering this is our God. Let us pray. Lord, may we come now into your presence. We come to praise you and to thank you for your love and mercy to us. We are all too aware of our shortcomings and our need for forgiveness. So often we are caught up in our own world, our own concerns, that we don't recognise the needs of others or the state of our world. When we should stand up for justice, we turn away. When we see the suffering of countless human beings, we are overwhelmed. Lord, we would serve you, but we are weak and easily led. And sometimes it seems that there is so much wrong or so much that needs to change that we don't know where to start. Teach us to begin with you. Amen. If you would like now to recite the Lord's Prayer, please take a moment to spend time with it. We're going to sing as well, or share together, the hymn 1012. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. These are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. I'm going to take our lesson for today from the Book of Acts of the Apostles from chapter 12. It's quite a long lesson. Um, it's 25 verses and I'm going to read it all uh, and I'll tell you why at the end. Uh, and I'm re reading it from the uh, Revised Standard. Chapter 12. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quarters of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made for him without ceasing of the church and to God for him. When Herod would have brought him forth, that same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door of the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came unto him, and a light shone in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Get up, quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself, bind on your sandals, and cast on your garments and follow me. And he went out with him and followed the angel. 
but he didn't know whether it was true and thought that he had seen a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came into an iron gate that led unto the city, which opened to them of its own accord. They went out and passed on through one street, and eventually the angel departed from him. When Peter was come to himself, he said, Now surely I know that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and all the expectations of the people of the Jews. When he had considered this thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to the gate named of Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she didn't open the gate for gladness, but she ran in and told them how Peter was standing before the gate. And they said, you are mad. But she continued to affirm that it was so. And they said it must be his angel. But Peter continued to knock. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he beckoned to them to hold their peace and declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Go and show these things to James and to the brothers. And he went on to another place. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him, he couldn't find him. And he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend. And they desired peace because their country was fed by the king's country. Upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal clothes, sat upon his throne and made a speech to them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of God and not of a man. And immediately the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten with worms and gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Thanks be to God for that word. I know it was a long lesson, but one of the reasons that I wanted to include that last bit about Herod it just shows that you can't mess with God. You know, Herod, he killed James. He had the soldiers killed who were supposed to be guarding Peter. He thought that by taking Peter, he could please the Jews. He thought that he was in charge. Herod, the grandson of Herod Agrippa, who killed the children at the birth of Christ, the nephew of Herod Antipas, who was part of the trial of Jesus. Not a good family history to have, really, is it? But then, look what the end was. He came to dust and was eaten by worms. <laughs> Don't mess with our God. Don't think that you can get away with it. God is almighty and sees everything. Let's have a look now at the rest of that lesson from the Acts of the Apostles, the beginnings of the early church. We've got a time of challenge in front of us, a time when we will have to regroup, rebuild, find new ways of doing things, change what we do, change how we think, and it's interesting to look at how the early church was built, how people worshipped together, 
prayer together, how they coped with all the difficulties, how they coped with a new start. We look back to the beginning of Pentecost and the joy of the coming of the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of the fruits of the Spirit, the speaking in tongues, the healings, the tremendous 3,000 strong conversions, the harvest of the Spirit. We cannot fail to be amazed at the power of the risen Lord. And the disciples were out there preaching and teaching and healing people more than they'd ever done before. Not just the 3,000 converts that first day, but 5,000 a few weeks later. What a time to be a Christian. What a time to be in at the very beginning. Sharing in all this, this tremendous power. And yet even so, in that glorious beginning, with the abundance of the Holy Spirit pouring out, with the acts that he did, things already started to go wrong. Ananias and his wife Sophia lied to the church about their wealth in Acts chapter 5. It's not keeping back the money that's the problem. It's lying to the Holy Spirit. It's not saying, well, I'll only give half to the church or a tenth or whatever it is. That's fine. But don't try and deceive God by pretending to be something that we're not. Trouble was, it brought a lot of fear and consternation to the early church. People didn't really know what to expect. By treating God with contempt, they damaged what was part of the early church. They thought God wouldn't notice. Then there were problems between the Greeks and the Hebrews. Both of them claiming that their widows and dependents were being neglected, that favouritism was being shown. I find the response of the disciples very challenging, particularly to us with what we face now to rebuilding the churches. It's not right that we should leave the word of God and serve at table. Or, as the Good News Bible says, we shouldn't be leaving the preaching of the word of God to look after the finances. Waiting at tables filling in forms, dealing with the banks, chasing the electric board or the plumber. They're all things that need doing in a modern church and they're all things that need people to do them. But the disciples are right, you know. There's one more thing that's so much more important than anything else and that is the sharing of the word of God. It has to be paramount. It has to be part of a growing, living church. Just as in the story of Mary and Martha, Luke tells us that Martha was cumbered about with much serving while Mary sat at the feet of Christ and listened to his word. I've always had a lot of sympathy for Martha. I'd be the one running around like headless chicken. But I do know Given the choice, there's no better place than to sit at the foot of Christ and listen to him. There's no better place to be. And if we spend our time talking about the gospel, caring for people's souls, if it has to be our number one priority, everything else should fall into place. Let's go back to Peter. The first few verses of the chapter remind us what the disciples were up against. We think one of the biggest problems these days is combating the apathy that we see around us. People don't care. People don't want to hear. People don't want to know. But we're not put to the sword. Certainly we in this country are not threatened for our faith. And if we are, it's minor compared to the, what the early church had to face. Herod killed James, and for no other reason 
master because he saw that it pleased the Jews. He took Peter also. <laughs> this time Herod's taking no chances because he'd had Peter in prison once before. And Peter had escaped. Ingenious, these Christians, you know. They rise from the dead. They remove huge boulders. They walk out of locked prison cells. Despite all of Herod's precautions, the angel led Peter out past the first guard post and the second. It's amazing, isn't it? You know, Peter knew what Herod was capable of. And yet when the angel turns up, he's asleep. He's asleep between two guards, chained up, but asleep nonetheless. And so up he goes, till eventually they reach the iron door, and it opens automatically onto the street. Sometimes in our life, we meet an iron door, something that seems like an insurmountable problem. Other obstacles may have faded away. Other hurdles have been removed. But then we come to something that makes our faith tremble. That makes us back down. Makes us give up. We cannot take that leap of faith. Peter thought it was all a dream. He thought he'd seen a vision. Until God removed that final barrier. Now I know it is the Lord, he says. We have a church to rebuild from the bottom up. New people to welcome, new challenges, new beginnings. And we can't let the chains of the past stop us. In a few weeks' time, we hope, when the restrictions are finally lifted, to hold a celebration at Longhorn, to celebrate new beginnings. And to welcome back all those who've been involved with us in the past. And whatever church you're with, you're welcome to come. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of work from all of us in all different churches to make that new beginning. It's going to take faith. It's going to take prayer. It's going to take belief that we can do this. And the church might not be called Longholm or Saxteads or anywhere else like that. It might be a completely new building, a completely new church. But nothing should stand before between us doing it. We can't let our faith waver. We can't look at the iron door and say, it can't be done. Many years ago, my father-in-law sent me a card when I was going through a bad time, and it said, those who say it can't be done should get out of the way of those who are doing it. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we will rebuild. There will be a new beginning. Amen. I've chosen for the next piece of music, not a hymn or an anthem, but a pop song, in fact. Um, a pop song by a guy called George Harrison, uh, now, if you're my age, you will have heard of George Harrison. He was one of the Beatles. And if you've not heard of the Beatles, well, tough. Um, you'll probably be able to find it on YouTube. Uh, but it's the words that I really wanted to record. The words that say, it's going to take time. A whole lot of precious time. It's going to take patience and time to do it right. It's going to take money. A whole lot of spending money. It's going to take patience and time to do it right. And it is. It's going to take all those things, money, time, patience, hard work, prayer, everything to set things right in our churches, in our fellowships. It's going to take all of us working together, praying together. It's going to take all of us lots of patience, time, money. But it can be done. Covid has left us with a, a difficult legacy. But we can rebuild. And we will. The I did shows as well is number 18. All over the world, the spirit is moving. All over the world, as the prophet said it would be. 
in that lesson from the Acts of the Apostles, we're told that the church prayed for Peter without ceasing. And the theme of prayer has been very popular amongst our ministers over the past few months. I think that's because of the enormity of what we're facing in rebuilding our churches is seen by all of us as a task that's got to be done. And we can't do this on our own. One of my favourite psalms, Psalm 127, reminds us that unless the Lord builds the house, we labour in vain that build it. So let's get this church rebuilt. It may not be called Longholm or Central or Stacksteads, but it will still be the church for which Christ died. And when I look at the early church, and when I look at this lesson from the Acts, I find that there are things that we can learn from the early church. There are things that they did, things that were important to them as they started out from a complete new beginning. One of the things, and I'm not one really for explaining the meaning of words in the Greek or the Latin, because I'm bound to get it wrong. But one of the things in this passage is constant prayer. Prayer without ceasing. And it's not just about the length of the prayer or the time we spend in prayer. But it's about the earnestness of prayer. The striving to be heard. Like an athlete straining every nerve and every muscle to succeed. There's no point coming before God in prayer if we don't care. He wants us to care deeply about the things we bring to him. There's no point coming to God in a sort of cavalier fashion. He wants us to engage with all our senses, our intellects, our desires that we can share within the deepest thoughts of our hearts and our minds and the deepest desires that we have. We should pray earnestly for the rebuilding of our churches and our fellowships together. But certainly when we think about prayer, let us be sure that we come into the presence of God. Yes, we can speak to God at any place, at any time, anywhere. It doesn't matter. But to have a growing, meaningful relationship with him. It's not enough to send him a two-line text occasionally or an emoji on the phone. We need to treat God with respect. We need to value the privilege of being able to talk to him. Remember what happened after the crucifixion when the veil of the Holy of Holies was torn in two. For once, God was accessible to mankind. Not separate, but brought into our beings through the death of Jesus Christ. He bought that privilege for us by his death on the cross. We can't treat it casually. We can't think, oh well, I'll just have a quick word. It's not what prayer is about. It's about speaking to the almighty God. Time in silence. Not competing with the radio or the television or the phone. You know, we talk about me time. Oh, I need me time. But this is God time. And that's even more important to spend time with God. But finally, pray believing. Pray believing that you will receive. I had a friend once, an old lady, who was told that she was having lots of problems with her sight and that she might eventually go blind. She lived on her own. Her son and her husband were both dead. And when she went home, she prayed all the way home, Lord, don't let this happen. Lord, don't let this happen. I can't, I can't cope with it. Please don't let me lose my sight. But when she got home, she started teaching herself so many paces to the sink, 
so many paces to the cooker, so many paces to the table. And eventually she realised that she'd been praying all this time, but not believing. She never did go blind. Even though she lived to be nearly a hundred, she still maintained her sight. And sometimes, yes, we do have to make contingency plans. But we also have to pray believing that God will help us. Mark and John and Mary, you know, and all the others, prayed constantly for Paul, for Peter, sorry, in constant prayer. But, you know, they were astonished, absolutely astonished, when he knocked on the front door. It's like they didn't expect an answer. Or they didn't expect that answer. They didn't expect him to turn up. So much so they accused Rhoda of being mad when she went and told them he was there. God answers prayer. Sometimes in a more spectacular way than we can ever begin to imagine. Sometimes in ways that we have never dreamt of. Now is the time for prayer. Pray more than we've ever prayed before because this gospel of ours, this church of ours, wherever it may be, is so important. I know we've never faced anything like this before in our lifetime, but neither had the early disciples. They didn't know what it meant to start a new church. They didn't know that they would travel the miles that they travelled. They didn't know that they would speak to the people they did, from lay people to emperors and, and kings. They didn't know what the future would bring. But they went out in the power of the Holy Spirit. They went out believing in earnestness and prayer and in trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And to close with the hymn number 1014, we have sung our songs of victory. If you get the chance to read the words from the hymn book, it's a lovely hymn. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, to bring us spotless and joyful into God's presence, to God our Saviour, Jesus Christ, be glory, majesty, dominion and power, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>